Well, thank you, Isaac, and thank you, Micah GD, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I feel honored because Isaac was one of the first designers I ever worked with at my first ever design job in New York City. Uh, we worked at a studio called Pure and Applied, and uh, where Isaac was senior designer and I was a design intern. Um, I remember being dazzled by how quickly Isaac navigated various programs and windows and projects and zooming around and, you know, and always gave, giving me good advice, especially to learn, you know, your keyboard shortcuts. So I definitely took that to heart. <laughs> um, additionally, I, I'm doubly honored uh, to be speaking at MICA because um, this is where I learned to do graphic design. Um, I had studied English in undergrad, as Isaac mentioned, and became interested in graphic design through um, a book, like a book publishing job. And I decided to make a career change and spent, and so there's, therefore spent three years at MICA continuing studies, taking classes and working my way through their continuing studies program. Um, so I guess in, in, in a way, things have finally come full circle, um, a, a fact that, you know, has influenced my talk for today. Um, the projects I'll be showing are, you know, it got a little bit personal as I was planning this, um, just because thinking about Isaac, thinking about my first design job and thinking about Micah. And so I've picked a couple of projects that I don't typically get to put in my portfolio, um, but, you know, definitely represent key moments in my design journey. So they're somewhat process oriented. So they, so, you know, steal yourself. They may not be as, as flashy and, and slick uh, of visuals as, as you're used to. <laughs> so let me share my screen. <laughs> so Isaac will recognize this. Uh, so to start at the beginning, um, the street design manual. Um, this was my first major project um, that I was assigned at Pure and Applied by one of the principals, Paul Carlos. Um, and uh, I remember him saying to me as he gave me this project and a pile of you know papers and flash drive that this is going to take over your life. So, and he, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm going to show and, and kind of talk about the process of working on this manual. Um, oh, and just, I've put in these slides just because, you know, in putting these presentations together, I always feel a little bit nervous about crediting. And so just to clarify, this was done, you know, while I was at Pure and Applied and the photography are a combination of um, Pure and Applied's, from Pure and Applied's website and also the NYC DO, oh, DOT, sorry, typo, DOT.gov uh, website and just like my own photography. Um, so here is a detail of the manual. It was designed for the New York City's Department of uh, Transportation, initiated by then Commissioner Jan uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan, who's holding the first edition of the manual there. Um, this manual provides policies and design guidelines to city agencies, design professionals, developers, and community groups for the improvement of the streets and sidewalks of New York City and the five boroughs. Um, it was intended to serve as a comprehensive and updatable resource, um, hence the, the kind of format of it, the binder and the loose leaf and the tabbing. Um, and you know, the, the goal of it was to pro, pro share and promote higher quality street designs and, and sort of guidelines for more efficient project implementations. Um, in a lot of ways, it was the perfect project to give a young designer. Um, it was definitely an exercise in parsing and organizing somewhat dry <laughs> information and uh, making information vi visual whenever possible. As you can see, um, you know, always trying to extract um, an infographic here and there when you can. Um, so this proved very challenging for a lot of the, I, so I, I basically did all the illustrations in the manual, um, one of which is this sample streets diagram. Um, uh, and, you know, and it wasn't enough to kind of just make it look good. I, I, I believe I, if I, if I'm remembering correctly, 
I literally revise this illustration 20 plus times because when your clients are engineers and they don't care about how, you know, how pretty something looks, they're looking at it, you know, from a technical perspective. And so I remember sort of amending the shapes of sidewalk curbs and stuff over and over again, but you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> that's what this manual needs to do. Um, so, you know, it was definitely very, um, uh, it was definitely a good exercise in a lot of different types of diagrammatic language and like using different views and different techniques, combinations of photos, as well as just, you know, kind of your vector, vector diagrams and, and charts and color. Um, and yeah, just in general, a, a great exploration. Um, and also, you know, I think like, a, like an obvious thing to point out here is the use of color. Um, each chapter was divided by color corresponding to a tab and corresponding to an icon. Um, so, you know, just any kind of like, any kind of way to visually pull out the information and make it a little bit accessible for whoever's looking at it. Um, and, and so just a little bit about the structure, you know, each, each chapter had a chapter opener that, that was, that had, that was on a thicker stock with the, the icon, um, and was followed by a table of contents that listed all the various items, um, that, you know, that section was referring to, and also these kind of crazy charts of, you know, um, ref, like references guides and, you know, I, I guess like I, to the lay person, this may not look, <laughs> Very interesting, but I, you know, but I think it's just a, a handy way to kind of like see a lot of um, items at the items and characteristics of the materials at the same time. Um, also within the chapters, there are these subsections, and so this chapter is, is obviously on materials, and within that, they have they separated into subsections of roadways and crosswalks and things like that. Um, Yep, and also, you know, and then getting into the kind of individual pages and individual subjects, um, you know, they all, I set up this three column layout color coded to the section, of course, and then illustrated with a mixture of photography and diagrams whenever necessary. Um, you know, I think that it's it's uh, it's an interesting project because in some ways you're not trying to, you're not use you, you don't, care as much about how nice the photography looks or how nice the images look it's more about like how like sometimes just like an ugly photograph um can can communicate better than you know a, a somewhat more photoshopped or um, stylized image yeah more examples of all the the different types of street lamp heads that i illustrated and i have to say you know um for the longest time, I would like walk down the New York City streets and be able to kind of identify different lamp heads, I think, which was really annoying to anybody who was walking with me. And then the appendix section, you know, I think like this is was definitely the whole project was aimed to be a very practical manual and practical document of ref with references and also a glossary and kind of sample worksheets and forms for people to reference, fill out, and then sort of start the, I guess, the review process for their various street design projects. And then, uh, and then I believe uh, Peer, Peer and Applied obviously designed the second edition of the street design manual. So it's cool to be able to see that, you know, they've, con like this format has sort of held with some updates. Um, and um, the first edition of the manual was part of a larger effort to transform the city streets from a network, you know, designed primarily for automobiles into one that supported safe and convenient travel for people um, on a diversity of modes. Um, so the manual is now in its third edition. Um, and since it's been 10 years, I guess, since the 2009 first edition. Um, the city has reshaped how New Yorkers and visitors experience its streets. And this is just an example of like a before and after um, image of like how they've really designed the streets to uh, with the pedestrian in mind. Okay, so another, the, the second project I'll talk about is 
uh, another manual, Oyster Gardening on Oyster Gardening. Um, this was a project that I worked on. <clears throat> I guess that was the last project that I worked on while I was working at the studio MTWTF. Um, and uh, the oyster gardening, and again, like just some photo credits and, and creative direction shout outs. <laughs> um, so the oyster gardening manual is a guidebook produced by the New York Harbor School in collaboration with SCAPE and MTWTF as part of the Rebuild by Design initiatives. Um, I know I just threw a lot of names and acronyms at you. So to parse things out or to give you a little bit of context. Um, Rebuild by Design was an initiative um, of the Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force and, the, and HUD, which is the how, and HUD aimed at addressing structural and environmental uh, vulnerabilities that Hurricane Sandy had exposed um, after the storm, um, especially in, especially in, in communities in Brooklyn and, you know, Red Hook in particular. Um, and they, this initiative was really aimed at developing fundable solutions to better protect residents from future climate events. Um, Rebuild by Design was developed to find better ways of implementing designs and informing policy through design. Um, and SCAPE um, is a design-driven landscape architecture firm and urban design studio based in New York. Um, their submission, so Rebuild by Design was a design competition and, um, and SCAPE submitted uh, their entry, which was called the Living Growing Breakwaters. Um, that's their proposal, um, which proposes the restoration of living um, reef ecosystems. Um, so basically they identified the South, Sto South Shore of Staten Island um, for risk reduction and um, have developed a whole kind of um, menu of ways to combat, you know, to stabilize the shoreline and to just sort of um, protect the region against waters and deterioration. Um, yeah. And next, the New York Harbor School um, is a public school located in New York Harbor on Governor's Island. Um, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool place. Um, it's only accessible by ferry. Um, and it's a public school that um, focuses on marine science, marine technology, and marine policy. And basically, you know, I think they're, yeah, if you look at the website there, the language is that they, they prepare their students for careers on the water, which I thought was, is, which is a very interesting kind of um, mission. And lastly, MTWTF, like I mentioned before, is the studio that I worked for. Um, they and who was partnering partner, partnering with Scape to um, to enter the Rebuild by Design competition. Um, so MTWTF is a graphic design studio specializing in environmental signage and graphics, identity systems, interactive design, and publication platforms. Um, they create. They focus on strategic creating strategic communication objects and making complex information more accessible. So now that I've sort of gone over all the players um, a bit about the project. Um, so this was in 2003 um, and uh, at the time SCAPE was putting together their entry for the Rebuild by Design initiative and MTWTF was asked to come on as a partner to help with graphics and uh, competition materials. Um, this project stands out in my memory or in my thinking of design because it really pushed my understanding of what graphic design was or could do um, in that it shifted the role that design plays like, in the world, um, like you know, I think I, I was very focused on these kind of outcome-driven, like on these outcome-driven definitions of design. So throughout this whole process, which was like a very um, long and kind of like massive process of meetings and conferences and meeting with all these like interdisciplinary um, collaborators, um, I found myself asking, you know, what are we designing? Like, what's the product? Who's the client? You know, what's with all these like meetings and conferences? So um, 
the scale of the project was so vast and involved so many different people and interests that it just it took me a while to realize that you know we basically we were there to do whatever we needed to do to communicate and push forward the living breakwaters projects you know goal and message um we made maps illustrations, posters, displays like this one. Um, I actually did a lot of these sea creature <laughs> illustrations that you see in the teal and had, you know, done drafts of like the different presentation boards. Um, but essentially, you know, we were making communication tools that helped facilitate discussion and ultimately, um, you know, start conversations with people and enact change in the physical environment. Um, so oyster cultivation. <laughs> oyster cultivation was just one part of Scape's many kind of like strategies to restore the, the shoreline in Staten Island. Um, and so oysters actually, um, oyster cultivation and the building of oyster reefs actually um, help sort of attenuate, you know, waves and they they clean the water and they also provide um, stabilization for the shoreline and also encourage, I guess, like a lot of other marine animals. And, and so basically just they, they help a lot to promote a healthy habitat um, or ecosystem. Um, they partnered with the Harbor School and they invested in, um, the Harbor School's billion oyster, the, the Billion Oyster Project, which aimed to restore 1 billion oysters in New York Harbor over the next 20 years. Um, and so their, oh, let's see. their school based oyster gardening projects um, employ students as restoration scientists. Um, and so the students, they help to grow and monitor oysters. It's very hands on. They, you know, they visit different nursery sites and um, this kind of experience is aimed to provide students with, you know, just, yeah, exposure to scientific procedures and training them to be the next generation of scientists, stewards, and hopefully advocates for the harbor. So yeah, for the manual, um, we took the ferry over to Governor's Island and met with the harbor school team. Um, and so here's like, Here's their team. Who, this is Sam, who was like our main contact. And then, um, you know, we brought sort of preliminary drafts of our illustrations and the manual um, to review with them and to kind of correct any, to ask questions and to correct any kind of like technical details that needed to uh, needed correcting. Because again, similar to the street design manual, um, you know, illustrations um, have the power to, you know, they can be, they can look good and they can, and they can bring people in, but at the same time, like when um, you're dealing with subjects like oyster gardening or, you know, street design, things can get a little bit technical. And so it's really important to get certain details correct. Um, yeah. So uh, I so for the manual I I didn't do any of these beautiful illustrations. These were done by um, Boyan Choi. You can see her over here with the headphones, um, uh, and she's a freelance illustrator who was working with us at MTWTF. Um, so we started in the hatchery. <laughs> So where they where the green stuff is basically oyster food. I think it's like three different kinds of algae, and um, and so these are the oysters that they've selected to sort of I guess spawn and produce, you know, essentially gametes and baby oysters. Um, and once the so they basically trick the oysters into thinking that it's spawning season and then after they release their you know their eggs and sperm they get put in these tanks where they eat and mature and grow um and then after that um after like a one or two steps the baby oysters are transferred to nursery trays or garden cages here you can see sam pulling up one of the um garden cages located uh, on Governor's Island. Um, and so they're basically oyster nurseries where the oysters can kind of mature and yeah, and grow before they get transplanted to somewhere else. Um, and another part of the Billion Oyster Project is the collection and kind of recycling of oyster shells. Um, 
Oysters will settle on any hard surface, but they prefer um, the chemical and kind of physical composition of their own shells. Um, and so the Billion Oyster Project collects spent shells from local restaurants and brings them back to, um, to an outdoor curing site on Governor's Island. So we went in January, so they're covered with snow, um, but I think you get the idea. Um, curing takes at least six months of exposure to the elements and periodic turning uh, of the piles. Uh, and at the end of the curing period, shells are washed and prepared for remote setting tanks. Um, and of course, we got to sample some oysters too. Um, I forget if these were grown by the Harbor School or if this was just a gift from you know, a restaurant partner, but um, here are some images of us sampling edible oysters. <laughs> and then back in the studio, this is you know, just some process images of bland um, creating these large kind of technical like kind of I guess like panoramas in a way. Um, and these are the kind of the, the finished product. Um, so they illustrate the five different stages of the Billion Oyster Project. And so this is this is sort of the illustrated version of what we experienced on the tour. So you'll see the algae tanks and the oyster food and then the various stages that the oyster, the baby oysters go through. And yeah. This is the illustration, a detail of the shell recycling illustration. And then finally, the, the finished manual. Um, I guess that, um, this, this project was very interesting because, you know, I was kind of involved um, in the whole kind of competition process for uh, the living breaking, uh, the living breakwaters. But, you know, but really, I don't really have anything to, show for it, you know, speaking just so the oyster gardening manual was kind of the only product, I, I guess, that came out of that process. Um, and so I think it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, kind of document of that experience. Yeah, and here's the photo of um, people from the escape and rebuild by design, holding up the manual and students using the manual and consulting the manual in uh, at the New York Harbor School. Okay, so we enter the Whitney. <laughs> um, so like Isaac said, you know, I, I guess I've been practicing graphic design on and off for 10 years now, uh, plus maybe two years um, in grad school. Um, where I don't know if that if you would really call that professional practice, but <laughs> you know exploration, I guess. Um, and uh, after MTWTF, so I, I guess like the first half of my design journey um, and design experience was gained working at small studios in New York City. Um, and then after grad school, I continued to do some studio work. And then in two, 2014, um, I decided to apply for um, a job, an open position at the Whitney Museum uh, on their in-house graphic design team. Um, and I guess, so I see my kind of design experience as being split into like half, five years, you know, working in small studios and then five years working uh, at the Whitney. So let's see. <laughs> So I joined the, so here is, you know, kind of like what you know or recognize as the Whitney Museum graphic identity. Um, and I joined the team in the fall of 2014, um, probably two weeks before the museum staff were to move in to um, their new building. Uh, the, the museum was kind of at this pivotal point because they had um, rolled out this new identity the year before in 2013 um, and were positioning themselves to kind of um, make the move downtown. Um, oh, so again, uh, credits, all the work that I'm showing, you know, was done under the creative direction of the design director, Hilary Greenbaum, who is still the design director at the Whitney. Um, I didn't list the team members because, you know, they've changed a lot throughout the years. And I, I don't know if I even really know anyone there anymore. I know a couple of people, but um, anyway, shout out to the Whitney design team. Um, also photography is, is all sort of a combination of 
um, come from a combination of sources. Um, the Whitney's website, design.whitney.org. If you don't know that website, you should definitely check it out. It's a great archive of all the work coming out of the graphic design department, uh, interspersed with kind of um, tagged photos of um, their work on Instagram. Um, and then of course, Whitney, Whitney.org, and then a bunch of the Whitney um, photographers. So yeah, like I said, like I said, um, in 2014, um, the Whitney Museum was moving from their uptown location, um, you know, leaving their home uh, in the iconic Breuer Building. I don't know how many of you have been to the old Whitney or know this building, um, but now it's the Met Breuer, so you know you, you can still check it out. But you know, for a long time, that's where the Whitney was, um, and they were moving to a brand new um, building or museum at in the meatpacking district designed by Renzo Piano. Um, it's sort of, as you can see, it's situated at the southern end of the High Line and you know it's and it's right on the Hudson. So uh, a very kind of high traffic and, and you know kind of cool location. <laughs> And part of what appealed to me about the new building was that, you know, like one of the one of the features of the building was that they had these like vast columnless gallery spaces. Um, you know, not only did would it with the new building have way more gallery space than the old building, but like there's the the lack of columns really allowed um, exhibitions to kind of um, uh, allowed exhibitions the freedom to change layout and change rooms and adapt it for you know whatever their purposes was. Uh, this image is from a show I think in 2016 I forget now or 2015 called Open Plan uh, where they invited five different artists to kind of program the fifth floor which is the largest floor in the building and so this is um, so this is an image of, of what that looks like with just kind of like completely empty space um, yeah and so the the gallery so each gallery also extended out into outdoor terraces which also sometimes house art but also but you know if they if there isn't anything installed you know it's just like a great kind of like visiting experience for for museum goers and um yeah great views <laughs> i guess you know i think considering I, I tell people this a lot. So there's me <laughs> when we when I started uh, at the Whitney, this must have been probably like two or three weeks after I started. Um, the staff made the move into the new building. And that was another part of, um, I think, the kind of environment that was really special that um, before the Breuer, the staff, the amount of staff has sort of exceeded the capacity of the Breuer building. So part of the goals of the new building was to be able to house both the art and the staff in one building. Um, and so when we started the building, I guess when I started, it was in the fall of 2014, um, the museum was slated to be open in the spring of 2015. Um, and I mean, essentially everything was almost there, but not quite. <laughs> This is a pano that I took of the fifth floor gallery, which you know kind of gives you a sense of like how kind of um, impressive it was, and you know how how crazy of a of a space it was to kind of be visiting every day and to have access to. Um, so, let's see. And I guess I'm starting with the building because um, be, you know I think one of the first projects that I was assigned to or worked on with along with some other designers on the team um, was to work on the dig digital signage in the building, um, specifically designing the spine screens. Um, these were installed in the galleries um, and also in the elevators. And so the design, the design essentially would draw from the plan of like the, the template for the Whitney Museum Guide. So, you know, using the Whitney typeface, Neue Health Grotesque, um, along with this kind of like um, line language and icons. <clears throat> so I guess in some ways, you know, um, 
there wasn't that much to design ex apart from sort of continuing this language of big floor numbers and and you know rules or skinny lines and adapting the design to for the kind of like functionality of the spines um and i maybe some of you remember this but you know in 2014 i feel i feel like digital signage was really new <laughs> and i and at the it, they, they they weren't as prevalent as they are now i mean now they're like all over the place um but at the time i i just remember all the designers kind of being not thrown but there were definitely many discussions of like well what is this thing you know like how do we design for it like how do we design for dynamic content you know like um and how do you do it you know in a way that isn't dynamic how do you think about it so um it was a uh, it was a very interesting kind of process to go through um and and a process that was less about the identity itself and more about sort of navigating the like technical specifications and, and to think about things in a different way. Um, so that was a gallery screen and these are kind of, these are two, these are the elevator screens, um, which have, which are essentially the same design, but have are adapted a little bit um, to uh, to accommodate sort of the the functionality of the elevators um, or the differences in functionality, mainly mainly that um, this elevator doesn't go to floor negative one, so um, that's the difference. And so that's how we would kind of communicate that this was like a like a inaccessible floor, at least in this elevator. Um, and so you know. Like I was saying, um, because this was kind of like a new thing and I had never really designed for um, a dynamic screen before, um, you know, it, it became, I like I, I thought it would be helpful to show these kind of spec documents that, that I created for the, the manufacturers of like the, the people who are gonna program the screens. Um, you know, you basically have to, it's yeah, in some ways like it's a different way of thinking in that you have to identify um and anticipate like different types of content and then um and then you know sort of allocate the maximum amount of pixels you can to each floor for the director directory design um and you know and the kind of spacing is determined by capacity and use um so for instance the fifth floor is kind of like the biggest floor both on screen and actually in reality and physically. And, you know, it being the biggest gallery floor, it's capable of housing multiple exhibitions and events. And so it got the most pixels. Um, and by the same logic, you know, the first floor represents the kind of minimum amount of space allotted for to, to message one exhibition and maybe like one event. And so these are the screens um, in C2. This one got a little fuzzy. <laughs> um, and my other call, and there were two other um, kind of formats of the of the digital screens in the building. Um, this was the, the one in the lobby. Um, there was only one screen, and it basically worked as a directory as well. Um, but you know, kind of just looked in the slideshow format, um, and also in the coat check. Um, a composite, like a really long kind of format made up of three different screens. Um, yeah, all of which sort of, um, you know, were designed with the, with the same, through the same process of, of, you know, identifying the type, deciding what kind of content we wanted, whether we wanted images, like what was appropriate, is it exhibition based only, or would it, you know, promote events or, you know, promote membership, you know, those are all kind of, um, decisions and discussions that need to happen with the internal museum staff. And so, yeah, again, you know, once you're done designing the templates for things, um, I guess like the, what I learned, what this is like the first time I experienced this at the Whitney is, you know, I think in a small studio, you design something and you kind of just like hand it off. And, and that's and then it's kind of done and you and you move on to the next project. Um, however, like one kind of difference in my experience at the Whitney is that um, you know you design something and then you have to make guidelines for it and you kind of you know there's a there's like a level of upkeep and development and also um, continued kind of um, 
review of it and and also guidance for your colleagues in terms of like how to use the thing that you've designed. Um, so these, this is obviously, this is a, a digital signage content submission guidelines that I had put for, uh, put together for um, the digital media department and um, digital media was, would, you know, share this with anybody who wanted to put up a message on the digital screen. Um, so, you know, so basically they, they go over the different types of signage here on the on the right hand page and the different formats, um, also different types of messaging and you know kind of technical considerations such as character limits and image sizing, and then for events you know like yeah and just like other other kind of like non exhibition related things and all the various kind of considerations and and capabilities of the messaging system. So digital signage um, aside, another kind of massive project that I got involved in when I started working at the Whitney um, was uh, the physical signage. Um, the Whitney signage was sort of divided into material or divided by material, mainly steel letters, which is what you're seeing here, um, silk screen and vinyl. Uh, with each material course roughly corresponding to kind of level of importance. So, you know, this being the naming of the gallery is in steel letters. And um, when I started the signage project for the new building was overseen by um, Francesca Grassi, who for was formerly the design director for the Whitney Museum, but then since became an independent um, designer, she had been brought back to, um, to specifically manage um, the signage project. And when I started, um, she was kind of finishing up her portion of it, I think with the goal of handing off the re rest of the signage package to the in-house team. So um, she had, uh, so I basically kind of like followed her around and helped her mock things up and, you know, sort of go over documents and take notes and started to familiarize myself with the you know, basically this, all the items in, in the package. Um, so after Francesca wrapped up the, the steel letter, the steel letter donor signage, um, she handed off silk screen and vinyl signage to, to me basically and to some of the other members of the team. And I continued to install silk screen signage for, you know, name spaces and offices and studios. Um, also, you know, the sort of signage for the, the identity signage for the cafe and restaurant were in silkscreen as well. So, you know, just sort of implementing those things and carrying out, you know, um, carrying out the, the good, clean, minimal signage in the rest to match the rest of the building. Um, and you know, while the this was an interesting project, and again, like um, it wasn't so much about the design. Like the design is so minimal, and the type is sort of decided upon that um, you know it kind of um, it really kind of flips your thinking about like what you're doing as a designer. Um, and you know, the um, so basically the. I guess like my role in the signage uh, implementation project was to was kind of like the role of like logistics or you know someone who someone who mocked up the the donor namings in paper as you see here uh, you know literally stick it up in the space um, and uh, you know and then trying to schedule a meeting. Oh, there's Hillary. <laughs> uh, you know, trying to trying to schedule a meeting with the appropriate partners to review said naming and, you know, for size, for location, uh, for spelling, you know, very important. Um, and, you know, basically trying to get sign off. Um, and for any namings that were over six feet, this is about eight feet, I would say, um, you know, I, it became this kind of like logistical thing of like, okay, where can I get a ladder? Like, you know, I'd have to call art handling or facilities um, and which in all fairness, you know, like getting a ladder for me wasn't super high on their list of priorities. So sometimes that aspect of the job could be challenging. Um, and, you know, like I eventually learned where some of the letters were stored 
and made friends with the art handlers. Um, I think uh, my uh, my ability to get ladders was greatly improved when my husband, then boyfriend, um, started freelancing for the art handling department at the Whitney, and so I sort of had a, an in. <laughs> yes, here's another ladder. <laughs> um, and basically, after locations and sizes are approved, um, it's time we it's time to schedule the installers. In this case, the silk screeners. Um, I don't know how many people, I think maybe this is just a, um, a, a New York thing, but you know, this is an image of Tom Black and his crew. Tom Black has a silk screening studio and they he basically had the monopoly on all the silk screen signage for New York museums, you know, for the last 30 years. Um, Tom has since passed away, but his team still, I think, work on, you know, signage for the Whitney, for the Shed, for the MoMA, all the, mu all the museums in New York. Um, so, you know, I, I, once the silk screeners arrived, um, it became this kind of exercise in moving them through the building. Um, you know, they come with their own ladders and scaffolding, thank God, uh, so I don't have to worry about that aspect of it. But, you know, like I, I help them coordinate the placement. They put up this film, as you can see, and any of you who've done silk screening um, know that this is, uh, well, or recognize this as this is the film that you use to burn the screen. So they use that for placement. And once, you know, they put it up and it looks good, um, they screen directly on the wall. And this is a system I think that Tom had developed, you know, a long time ago and, and you know, and it produces this like really clean, um, crisp uh, signage. And this is them silk screening on concrete. Um, I believe they actually made special, um, they developed special curved screens for screening um, at the Guggenheim as well. Um, so a lot of the silk screening and mock-up took place while the mu museum was under construction um, and or, you know, sometimes you're screening in a very high traffic area, which adds a whole level of complexity <laughs> to kind of moving people through, m moving the silk screen crew through the space. Um, you know, as a result, I got to know the museum, its elevators, guards, and stairwells really well. Um, and speaking of stairwells, um, once the donor signage was completed and implemented, another big chunk of the signage system was the wayfinding. So I, you know, I again like the the kind of design and layout of it was already spec'd out by the you know the design team. I think first by Jet Set and then by the design team, um, and and sort of refined by the design team. Um, so really, this project is is a lot about implementation, or at least in this phase it was. Um, so these obviously show large floor directionals um, and they and they, they sort of continue as smaller breadcrumbs um, into like the adjacent hallway spaces. Um, and after all the wayfinding was implemented um, and we opened to the public, um, it's interesting um, because we learned as, as the museum opened and as people came in and moved through the space, like we realized there, there were major circulation issues. Um, and, you know, and that's something again, that you don't really hear about, like if you weren't sort of inhabiting the space that you designed for. Um, so that was like something new, new to me in my like sort of design um, experience. Um, so this is a plan of the museum um, and I and uh, I hope you guys will humor me because and as I take you through this I hopefully not too dry um, analysis of like the circulation in the building. Um, so this is the plan um, and in fact it's, it's the elevation that's printed in the museum guide that's handed out to visitors when they come um, and Visitors, uh, tip, as you can see, like visitors typically are ushered up by, uh, by the elevators up to the eighth floor and then encouraged to kind of work their way down um, using stair A, which is this stair here. Um, and then and then from there, uh, they're encouraged to walk through the fifth floor galleries to access the lobby um, via a second stairwell called the Grand Stair. Um, and 
to access the grand staircase through the lobby, well, that's the ideal route um, and one that is obviously kind of implicitly uh, communicated in the museum guide. Um, after we opened to the public, we found that there a lot of the times visitors would be trapped in stair A because they didn't know to kind of do this jog and and you know and basically if you and if they were to consult the guide like there are no stairs here. <laughs> um, so to give you a sense, um, part of the reason why visitors got confused was because stair A looks like this. For visitors, you know, you'll recognize this if you've been to the museum. Um, you know, it, it's a fire stair uh, with heavy doors. Um, that aren't particularly inviting and you know and another source of confusion is that a lot of the times the levels are double high the floors are double high so um, so to help you sort of visualize this um, this is this really scary ugly document that I made uh, at the Whitney when I was uh, when I was trying to sort of evaluate the circulation and signage in the stairwell um, and just to Here's details of, so basically this is the entire stair A, um, all the different levels. So on the left side, you this is what you see at the museum, which is a beautiful view of the Hudson. And this is what you would see um, as you descended the stairs. So a lot of the times visitors would make their way down and be confronted with landings that had no signage and no door. And so um, in a lot of ways that, that added to the confusion of like how where where they were going and you know um it's in particular this one issue that i will talk about that i'm yeah that i'm going to explain <laughs> um so basically these two even if they were able to sort of deduce the the path that you were supposed to go to um the fact that the guy doesn't show the stairwell is like a major, definitely a major cause of the confusion. Um, and another thing that sort of complicates that is um, is if the if the fifth floor were to were to close for installation. Let's say you're coming down the stair and and you were going to go through the fifth floor to access the grand stair. You had read the map correctly and you were going to do that. You would be met with the locked door here. Um, in which case many people will continue to go down the stairs. Um, and uh, the problem with that is if they kept going, they would encounter the fourth floor, which is not even called out on the museum guide because the fourth floor is the all staff floor. So I, when I, the graphic design department worked on the fourth floor along with other departments and uh, that floor is totally inaccessible to the public. Um, so they would encounter the fourth floor, which looks like this. Um, and at that point, um, and it didn't seem to, and these directionals outside the fourth floor didn't seem to help either. Um, it, you know, it, it was, it's hard to say whether visitors actually read this or not. And even if they read it, like it's quite possible that they didn't understand what to lower floors mean or found it irrelevant. So um, oftentimes they would keep going and, Keep going to the third floor and you know if they're trying to get out of the museum or just get to the lobby like you know logically they would continue down the stairwell to the first floor but however um you know the first floor there is no access from stair a so this so visitors um, oftentimes would end up going down and down and down to negative one where they're confronted with uh an alarm door uh and so <laughs> for the brave people who you know who are just desperate to get out, they push through and set off the alarms and they're free. But oftentimes that they also have to circle back around the museum to get their coats and coat check and go through entry all over again. <laughs> um, so um, if you didn't in the in the sort of, I'm doing a, I guess I, I feel like I'm doing like a pick your own adventure kind of presentation right now. Um, but you know, if you didn't kind of force your way through the alarm door, you would backtrack. Um, in which case, if you're lucky, you would realize that, oh, hey, floor three is accessible. You get onto floor three and realize you can take the stairs. And I'm like, this whole study is based on the premise that, you know, a lot of the times the elevators which work and go to each floor aren't are really not the best way 
to navigate the museum just because of volume. Um, you know, a lot of people, there are lots of, sometimes there, there are long waits and sometimes there's malfunctions. So, you know, the this is why um, a lot of the wayfinding is really focused on the stairwell. <laughs> Yay. So as a, you know, as a sort of day two thing, once we started to realize, so we, the museum opened in May of 2015, and um, I put together the stair A signage evaluation in 2015, uh, in, in December of 2015. Um, and basically, you know, it kind of, it goes over um, a lot of the, you know, even though I think a lot of the, the kind of circulation issues are caused by architectural features, you know, of the building, um, really, you know, by that point, there's nothing we can do about it. So um, instead, I guess the museum and various stakeholders like decided to focus on the signage because it is something that we can change. Um, so this was uh, an evaluation that I put together that sort of highlighted what I what we considered to be um, the main problems. So the the top sort of bullet being that there's kind of too it looks this looks great, but you know there's a there's a little there's too much um, information that's being thrown at people. Um, you know, and also this kind of more um, specialized language distinguishing between the special the collection and special exhibitions like is is sort of meaningless to your average visitor. Um, and also this, the kind of nomenclature of two lower floors instead of saying two lobby or two stairs, you know, like is sort of in, is indirect in this way that causes a lot of confusion where people just completely ignore it and dismiss it. Um, and also, you know, the fact that the third floor has proven to be this sort of access point and, or like three way to the lobby um, is, is also not sort of like, um, communicated in this system. Um, so those are the kind of findings um, that we put forth, the graphic design department put forth to the rest of the museum. Um, again, so, you know, working sort of as like a, like with, with what we had and in, in like working, you know, in the most kind of like minimal way to better the signage system you know, we made a series of recommendations or small moves that could really, we felt could really clarify the signage. So one thing was to simplify um, the, the language for the average user. So instead of special exhibitions or the collection, you know, just use gallery, more a more universal word that people, you know, if you are a person walking through the museum and looking for, you know, the whichever show, like you're much more, likely to gallery will definitely communicate more to you than the collection or special exhibitions because you it probably makes no difference to you um, and also another recommendation was to you know add the third floor like sort of call out the third floor a little bit more and to also reduce the number of items like in the directory so you know don't message two restrooms if you know there's if you're already signing for one restroom like on this floor um, and then lastly, you know, find some way to kind of direct people to kind of access the lobby through the third floor. And, you know, co corresponding recommendations for the directionals in the hallway, again, just like simplifying and reducing like the amount of text. Um, and I think for some people, um, especially non-English speakers, like this can be a little bit daunting to read as well. Um, so that was in December and um, of 2015 and nothing really happened after that. Uh, and so I did two more explorations of the signage and stere, um getting more and more extreme. Um, and, you know, and so this was a, um, a stair, like a signage kind of like revamp or recommendation that I put together. And, you know, in, in some ways, like from a design standpoint or from an aesthetic standpoint it's a little sad because you're taking apart the cool kind of like directional with the arrows and that whole kind of lock up um yeah that we're so familiar with but at the same time like in the this this was something that I thought was a viable way to go um by using this kind of like 
breadcrumb um, strategy um, and to really kind of simplify um, the directionals for each floor. Um, okay, so yeah, so working your way from the eighth floor to the fifth floor and actually using kind of like more common vernacular like stairs or, you know, the magic word lobby. <laughs> So maybe typographically not as attractive, but you know, I think for the purposes of navigating the space, like you can't get any better than stairs to the lobby. Okay, so thanks for bearing with me on my kind of uh, signage wayfinding rant. Um, uh, you know, it was a problem that literally drove me crazy and um, took up a lot of time and energy, not to mention the fact that, you know, I, my desk was on the fourth floor where every day I would hear a trapped visitor like pulling at the inaccessible staff door and getting really frustrated. Um, lots, a lot of the times having to let people in or out or people coming on the fourth floor following, you know, a staff member and things like that. So. But I think in retrospect, what was so unique about um, that experience was again, like there's this kind of a direct line of communication between you and your audience. Um, and you know, if something's not working, if something that you designed isn't working, you hear about it liter literally. <laughs> so, okay, so on to, I guess, the responsive W. Um, yeah, while well, working, you know, I think like working in the new building was a big draw for me, but um, a, an even bigger draw, of course, as a graphic designer was the opportunity to work with the responsive W and this graphic toolkit that experimental jet set had designed. Um, and so this is, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this already, but it basically sort of demonstrates various, um, various versions of the responsive W. Um, and Another tenant, so basically by never cropping the artwork, um, that, that was a major kind of pillar of the, the graphic identity system. Um, so the W would always, the idea being that the W um, would always kind of adhere to the art and to the art's original proportions. Um, you know, this kind of conceptually represents the, the, the museum's um, respect for the artwork and what they call, you know, basically the the primacy of the art. So essentially, you put down the artwork first as is, and then the W, you know, takes up the rest of the space. And working with this minimalist system, um, like in the beginning was, yeah, in the beginning it was just like how learning how to draw the W, like, and then it became, you know, how do you typeset things to, and how, like, what are all the kind of like design calls you need to make in order to make something look like the Whitney. And, you know, it was really fun and rewarding when it worked. Um, and although Jet Set had um, launched the identity and with the graphic design department, with the whole suite of materials, um, you know, really, there was an infinite when I when I started at the Whitney, there was still like an infinite number of formats and situations that were yet to be explored by the in house team. Um, so these these are these are three pieces that we designed for the Frank Stella retrospective in 2015. Um, and, you know, I think this is a I thought this would be an interesting slide because, you know, this represents sort of um, questions that inevitably come up as you work with the system, for instance, you know, when is the W needed and when is it not, you know, like, when is it overkill, when is type and image just enough to communicate that this is the Whitney. Um, and also another interesting question that came up with Stella's work was, you know, um, he was a lot of uh, the retrospective included these shaped canvases. So working with the digital file, you know, what counts as the, what counts as the original dims? Like, is it the bounding box or is it the actual shape, like the silhouetted shape of the artwork? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, those were all, all kinds of like, those were very interesting questions to kind of think about and like work through and like workshop with the rest of the team. Um, and so executing this kind of minimalism was definitely 
more time consuming than I had anticipated. Um, and, uh, and the invite on the right, uh, this Frank Stella corporate breakfast invite um, represents a personal triumph for me in that I was able to draw a proper W um, while keeping the whole invite to one type size. So one of the kind of um, foundations of the identity is is to use as as you know few type sizes as possible. So we usually try to match the size of the the text to the size of the Whitney and the mark. Um, so I was able to do that and um, get the and fit this text and also get the artwork like as big as possible. So I thought I would throw it in there. Um, okay, another part of the early days of implementing the identity was to fold all the programs and departments under the umbrella of the of the Whitney's identity. So this is um, like a program and kind of application for the independent study program, um, which is an offsite separate, it's kind of its own thing. It was founded in 1968. Um, and it's a program that um, gives students or it fellows, any applicants pursuing art practice, curatorial work, or art historical scholarship and writing. Um, it gives them kind of a setting to engage in discussions and debates about artistic practice. Um, and so they had like visually, graphically, they had sort of like done their own thing. And so this was kind of our adaptation of like bring them or like our like version of bring them into the fold where we made like a I guess it's not quite a sub identity, but like, you know, basically this is like this kind of new look for the ISP, reducing it to the initials and then using the W to kind of um, signal that it, it is still part of the museum. And then this is a, uh, this is a, a report that I had designed for the education department. Um, um, and it's a document that compiled um, research and initiatives um, uh, of museums and, and sort of like uh, their, their research on the lasting impact of like team programs. They surveyed hundreds of museums across the country. The Whitney was one of like one of four major museums to kind of like um, head this thing. And the report was a culmination of all their findings. Um, so. From an identity standpoint, this was yet another kind of um, question as to, you know, like, how do we make something feel like the Whitney and the new identity while also sort of giving the teens in education like a, a sort of like look of their own or like a vibe of their own. And so, um, yeah, just some sample spreads to, you know, like working with a minimalist system, like it's actually pretty tricky to make things look minimal, I guess. Like you would think that the opposite would be true, but um, you know, these, the, the, the table of contents and these kinds of like big diagrams are kind of good examples of um, this one kind of like rule of the identity system, which is to always kind of distinguish between display type and text type and to always kind of like accentuate the, the contrast between the two. And you know, obviously, big numbers and just creating really clear hierarchy. I'm just I just want to look at the time. Okay. Um, another aspect of working on the identity is always sort of testing the limits or the thresholds of design templates. Um, so this is a an early ex uh, opening invite for two exhibitions that was that opened at the Breuer Building. Um, and basically, I think this was, I think this was done by the in-house team and maybe may have been part of the identity launch. But anyway, this is like an ex existing template that um, that we sort of looked to when we when we encountered a two exhibitions opening on the same floor at the new at the new building. So Stuart Davis and Danny Lyon, um, and. Five, we, we designed five opening invitations each um, for, because usually for these larger exhibition openings, um, the kind of entry times are staggered. So each invitation has a different entry time. So therefore the multiple kind of um, invites. And usually if you use different graphics, like it becomes easier for the staff to kind of identify who 
you know, which invites belong to like which entry time. Um, so uh, basically, I feel like this really, this was a doubling down on this kind of dual invite template. Um, you know, it, it's fine if it works, it's fine if it kind of, if you were able to assemble two images and the W and, and the text all it for one invite, but you know, to do it for five, I think was kind of, a, was a major challenge, um, especially because, um, you know, trying to get images that look good together as well as like fit the composition. And also I think another consideration was we were trying to, um, get the images to kind to show both images like on like above the fold, I guess. Um, so yeah, so this was another case where I feel like um, the template was kind of really pushed to the limit. And then and then of course you get like moments like this when the invites come in and you know they they look really cool. <laughs> so another piece that um, that we worked on is the or another piece that was sort of an iconic part of the, the launch was the, the member calendar. Um, this was definitely a piece that was designed um, or templated by Experimental Jet Set and then sort of um, executed and developed by the in-house team. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, but as the calendar sort of evolved and the museum evolved, like um, things got increasingly complex, um, you know, just, and, and it got, very time consuming to make, um, you know, like accommodating a multiple image cover, um, you know, required the kind of um, agreement of a lot of different opinions and stakeholders. So, you know, like what it's so the curators, curators have a say, the artists, um, like our communications person, and of course, like, you know, it has to look good. Um, additionally, the sort of um, lockup of setting the credits, um, setting it sort of like flush, and then having it sort of fill in the space with the text above it, you know, it, it took a lot of rounds of editing this text in order to make this panel look the way it was supposed to. Um, so finally, I think in the winter of 2016, like <laughs> all this came to a head as membership realized that increasingly the members were just going to the website for, um, for, for event details and all this information can be found on online. Um, so they came to us to ask for um, sort of, but I think like the, the, the most interesting part of that too was that, you know, membership acknowledged that this thing was getting too hard to produce. It's, it, it came out bi-monthly, so it was like every two months, but also just like the writing and the editing and the design of it um, was taking so long that it was more often than not always late. And so by the time people got it, like some events, you know, worst case scenario, maybe you missed an event um, and, you know, or it was just becoming less and less of a functional piece. Um, so membership um, came and talked to us, talked to the graphic design department, and um, asked us to sort to sort of redesign it in a way that sort of still captured, kept the spirit of it, but would sort of smooth out some of these like more hairy processes and or offer like, you know, some other alternatives to it. Um, and to also, of course, address the, the evolving nature of like the way the piece was used. Um, I guess the most interesting tidbit was that like people still like to have it on their fridge, even though it, you know, even though they didn't like this old one really didn't, they didn't really use it as a functioning calendar or, and didn't really refer to it, but I think just visually they liked to have it. So it had this nostalgic kind of, um, you know, it fulfilled this like kind of nostalgic need um, or just to have something cool looking up on the fridge. Um, so membership still really wanted to keep it. Um, and so this was the solution that, that I worked on and came up with with Hillary um, and, and, and also with the input of membership. So to really kind of like free up that, um, for lack of a better word, clusterfuck of like credits and, you know, and like an exact text and to also um, keep the sort of calendar vibe without listing every single event, because oftentimes you would have to wait a long time for events to be confirmed. And um, so in a sense, these are highlights and membership also reduced the publication of this to four times a year instead of six times a year. 
So these are some iterations. Okay, the Whitney Collection Award. <laughs> this is uh, this is the kind of last major thing I'll talk about. Um, so this was definitely one of the strangest projects that I had worked on. Um, so the museum came to the graphic design department to ask them to design an award uh, made out of concrete to give to Leonard Lauder, who has been um, a major supporter of the museum and the museum's uh, chairman emeritus. And you know he had he donated a huge amount of work to the Whitney's collection, and so the Whitney really wanted to honor him and his generosity with. Um, uh, this new award that they that they created for him called the Whitney Collection Award. Um, so the the kind of brief was that it you know it should relate to the building because it was also you know I think part of the money that Louder gave to the Whitney and all his financial support through the years really also funded this project, um, funded the new building project. Um, so it had to be sort of inspired or you know kind of like respond to the new building and the the kind of uh, graphic forms of the new building, which was really pretty, I don't know, that's, that's like, I thought that was like a really kind of fun um, requirement because like, as you can see, the Whitney looks different from every single angle. And a lot of people call it like a spaceship. I've heard it called many other different things. So yeah, I had to sort of like somehow relate to the building. They referenced this this um, commemorative piece that they had made um, in 2015, which is essentially a, a, a Lawrence Wiener, like to honor Lawrence Wiener, um, and it's it's basically a concrete puck. Um, so, uh, so we were tasked. I I was assigned this project and and was tasked to come up with. Um, the design of like the design and shape of an award. So the first question, I guess, was like, what should it look like? Because um, one of the things that the development department asked us to avoid was that you know because the the piece they'd like it to be made out of the, out of the same concrete that the building is built out of. Um, they wanted to, they the they were very invested in the shape of the award because they didn't want it to look like a headstone <laughs> so this was this like yeah this was like a like a um exploration into various shapes that could potentially work so just to share some references and then also materials um you know i think they wanted to incorporate concrete somehow but potentially it could um it could uh, you know add you could add like a second material to it you know if i were to summarize the materials of the new building it would be concrete steel and glass and so we looked at you know some other we pulled various references um some of them actual awards and other just like furniture or stuff on pinterest and you know obviously so my first sort of inspiration was this kind of like column part of this this is the I guess this is the theater overlooking the fifth floor terrace. Um, so I thought it would be fun to share these kind of initial sketches of like what could be um, or what what I, what we were thinking of for the for the award shape. <laughs> Some sandwich looking things look very kind of like book like and then or like you know the building also has a lot of these weird um like kind of trapezoid angles and so these two were kind of like ideas um also or it could be just a brick and maybe like a secondary material could be incorporated and um, to somehow signify whitney or make it feel you know special um or you know we took inspiration from the theater spaces and these sorts of graphic shapes that that emerge when the Whitney is lit up at night. So these are three, you know, using thinking we would use some kind of foil um, or, you know, this big like kind of shoe box shape, um, you know, get, sort of referencing a camera obscura or like a paperweight. Um, or it could be this kind of acrylic thing with something in the middle and, um, you know, like a like almost like a like a specimen. And then various other kind of just formal explorations of um, more traditional kind of like plaque-like shapes. Um, and then this got really crazy. Like this was like a, like a kind of composite of various shapes made out of various you know materials. Um, 
And then it got really crazy <laughs> where we were essentially kind of like, okay, maybe it's like just the, we just take like a part of the museum um, and, you know, like assemble like some weird shape with it. Um, and eventually uh, this was the shape that uh, got pulled from all that craziness to, to as, as something to move forward with, um, especially because um, this was the shape that this shape is actually the composite or the combined shape of the collection floors, which is floors um, six through eight. Um, and so it kind of made, even though like the shape doesn't exist on its own in the building, like it seemed like a nice kind of like chunk to work with. And so um, this was the proposal that we set forth um, to the stakeholders. And, um, you know, and then we started to, once they signed off on that, we started to look into materials and to see how we could incorporate text and also to see like what a corresponding invitation would look like. Um, so some crazy options, some different, you know, concrete types stacked and then an oh, even crazier one with wood and painted steel and concrete, like literally replicating the materials that make up the building. And then some kind of acrylic dealy with like an acrylic engraved plaque. Um, so getting increasingly complex. Um, eventually we settled on a more simple treatment and we moved the kind of tech space to the front. Um, and we started to look at um, these, these concrete objects that had silver leafing on them. Um, and so this was me holding a tiny model of the museum and trying to figure out, okay, so now, now that we've got the go ahead, like how can we, how do we fabricate this thing? Um, I'm not an architect. Uh, I don't know how to use Rhino or any kind of 3D rendering program, but I do have this like tiny little model. So I, what I did was basically measure the model and uh, make and scaled it up and made a paper <laughs> mock-up of it. Um, I don't look too closely. I don't think it's that accurate, but you know, it was a helpful kind of mock-up to get a sense of size and you know and scale in relationship to other things, and to just have like a physical object to reference. Um, this is it in relation to the Lawrence Wiener piece that I mentioned before, and um, and then I gave approximate like dimensions to my friend. Who was, an, who was an actual architect and he rendered it um, in Rhino. And we sent his specs to, we sent his 3D file to the concrete manufacturer who had manufactured the concrete for the building itself. And they sent us back this, <laughs> um, which looks pretty good, but is wrong because the, the silver leafing is supposed to be on the face and the text is supposed to be, you know, kind of engraved, but not leafed. Um, so round two, they came back with this, which is right, but looks really bad, especially because the porous concrete is not a smooth surface. And so it looked like they had used some kind of like silver paint. And so it was showing like every, the porous concrete is also really soft. So it was showing every single imperfection um, and all these kinds of lines. And then, but since we were coming up, you know, on the event, we had to have, we had to make a quick, you know, kind of stand in to give, to give um, Mr. Louder. And so um, as a stopgap, we took the first, we took the silver leaf, the crappy one, the crappy, um, you know, award prototype. And it had come with this like steel plate that they, I guess they had used to, to form the, to like, um, I guess imprint the text in. And so we took it to our carpenters and they epoxied the steel plate to the front of the, um, the, the second award that we received. And so this was what was presented to Mr. Louder um, the night of the event. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and with the, with the plan of sort of figuring out the material aspect of this um, award uh, post, post celebration. And meanwhile, I'm collecting like a whole series of like awards on my desk. And these things also weigh like 15 pounds. So lugging them around was like a, trying to find vendors to, or people to consult on the material and, you know, trying to source vendors uh, for silver leafing was getting to, to be a really physically taxing um, exercise. 
So finally, we, we got a third, we ordered a third award, um, thinking that, okay, well, they can't really handle this like silver, like silver leafing on their own. They're just concrete people. <laughs> so maybe we need to find a professional. So if they, if they fabricate the award for us, we'll, we'll source our own gilder. And that's when um, I talked to somebody in conservation and they recommended this woman named Sheelan Wilson, who is a master gilder and has been doing gilding in New York, I don't know, for like 30 years or something. She, she used to be um, a conservation or um, she used to restore pieces at Sotheby's and then ended up working on her own. She, as you can see, like her motto is, I can gild anything. So it was uh, when I finally got in touch with her and, and told her about my woes with the concrete award, um, she was uh, super game for the challenge. And here is a shot from her Instagram proving uh, she really can gild anything. <laughs> That's basketball and some crazy blowfish. <laughs> You should definitely check check her uh, check out her Instagram because she has many other crazy things that she's gilded on there. And finally, she gave us um, we we picked um, she gave us two samples of different silver leaf. The one and we went with the one on the right, which is palladium, and um, she was able to. This is a shot of her of the award um, that she just finished gilding in her studio. And um, and finally, we were able to present Mr. Lauder with the award that um, we had originally intended. <laughs> oh yeah, and also um, the invitation to match with silver foil. Okay, <laughs> sorry. This will, I promise I will. I'm gonna wrap up. Um, so I guess I'm going to end my talk by, um, I think the, the award was a really good way to, to kind of um, transition or pivot to um, some retail objects that I've designed. Uh, I, I, I really love working in retail because it's, it's so different than just the regular kind of print format and processes. Um, we have an amazing retail department um, and um, this is, this is, and we and we oftentimes, you know, work with a lot of different collaborators. So this is a not a bag, which is a bag slash tote bag that um, a, a tote bag that sort of transitions into a backpack that is um, made by a German company called Not a Bag. And in I think I forget when in 2017 we partnered with them to um, make like a special Whitney. Whitney edition one, an exclusive Whitney one. And so the design is inspired by the facade of the building and um, being, you know, I think th this kind of a bag is pretty popular with um, bike commuters in the city. Um, I, we also um, sourced um, a reflective ink to kind of make, uh, to make the, the design of the bag. So that's, um, and I de I've definitely been biking around the city and seen people <laughs> with the bag on, um, but was unable to get a photo because usually I'm on my bike and I it, it can be quite dangerous to try to snap a photo. <laughs> and then another kind of small project was um, packaging or this kind of like Whitney branded packaging for apparel in the shop. So. Um, Lori Friedman um, in our retail department, um, you know, she's, she wanted to make like this kind of, she wanted to come up with an, um, like an easier solution for packaging all like our t various t-shirts and to, to set up a system where they didn't have to do custom stickers and that um, the staff would essentially be able to just, you know, kind of circle what size um, what sizes was inside and also to, to work with this um, Tyvek material. So um, I put together this for her. And so if you visit the museum today, you'll see, you know, that not only the emergency uh, emerging artist uh, t-shirt uses this packaging, but a lot of different uh, other different t-shirts are also kind of packaged in this Tyvek material. And lastly, um, this is uh, the, these are, this is for the Grant Wood show um, that happened a couple of years ago and another kind of fun retail thing we were making buttons I don't think like you know the graphic design department the buttons were outsourced and so we were asked to make 
a button backing um, just just to uh, obviously this is American Gothic for those of you who don't know. Um, so this is the backing that I designed and I think just um, coincidentally the the kind of the pins of the pins uh, like perfectly sort of bisect the W in this way. And so, um, you know, this was another kind of like moment of triumph, a uh, small moment of triumph for me. And it really made me think about this meme, which I don't know if you guys have seen, but yeah, where, <laughs> where high school friends says, my husband just got a promotion. I'm pregnant and we just bought our first house and me trying to connect to anchor points, uh, you know, on a vector. And uh, I, you know, I think that like this represents a lot of moments for me. Uh, I think working with the Whitney identity, but also just being a graphic designer in general. But at the same time, you know, like I think part of what's been great about working with the Whitney's graphic design, graphic identity system is that like, um, it, you may not, you know, you're, what you're doing may not impact things like big picture all the time, but you know, uh, it offers a lot of small everyday victories like this button back. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Virginia, thank you. Um, <laughs> that that was, uh, I think, uh, a really great talk. Um, I, I really appreciate um, how you sort of walked us through the realities of like <laughs> that a design can look good, but doesn't mean that it works well. Um, and and that like part of what you've gotten to do with the the Whitney job, especially, is to like really like live in your design and evaluate it and reevaluate it. Um, I thought that was really great. And, and also just in, in, in the two plans that uh, preceded it, uh, the sort of like specialization that projects can allow you to have, uh, especially like ones that have like a lot of technical specificity that then you have to sort of like translate for different audiences. Um, but I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, uh, uh, for members of the audience, um, if you have a question for um, Virginia, uh, please feel free to say hello and unmute. I'm looking at the chat, but <laughs> please feel free to actually ask me a question. I have a question. Oh, I have two questions. Okay. Um, hi. Um, Hi. First, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really, really awesome to like see the nitty gritty of things. I think like most presentations are, I mean, like in the beginning you said, I'm not going to show like the flashy stuff. And I kind of enjoyed that like aspect of process. Um, so that was awesome. Um, so I guess my first question is um, what, I guess, not happened, but like what motivated you to have that change um, in environment? So I guess like going from a small studio um, to a place like the Whitney um, mm. and like you mentioned going to grad school. So like, did that have um, like influence in that change? And then my second, second question is, um, I guess, I feel like this is a question that a lot of people ask, but um, what is like the biggest difference between like these two workplaces and like beyond just like team size and like the obvious kind of differences of um, of the two, I guess, what would you say, like, working and you noticed that, like, was, um, I guess, the biggest change for you, for the difference for you? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I guess my, like I said in the beginning, you know, my experience was mostly in small studios, and I, I had always really enjoyed working for the smaller studios, because I felt like they, they, their collaborators were like so varied and the projects were so different. And also they, they just seemed to get to do a lot of like cool stuff and also new stuff, like work with new organizations or for, you know, like um, larger projects like the, you know, Rebuild by Design um, initiative um, projects that I, that I showed, you know, just like, I, I felt, I feel like in the small studio environment, um, I always felt like it was a good way to learn and you know also the small studio environment is also a little like 
more scrappy. <laughs> you know, I think like I started out um, like seeking out positions in smaller studios because I felt like that would be my, that would be a good way to kind of like get my hands on or get my hands in everything. So that, that sort of, that was like my strategy for gaining more experience as, especially as a designer who, who didn't study graphic design in undergrad, you know, I, I definitely was trying to make up for um, education through exposing myself to these like more potentially challenging like exper experiences of working uh, in smaller studios. So um, I guess that kind of that answers your first question, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And um, and I I decided to I did I think when I applied for the Whitney I I. I didn't, I hadn't really made a conscious decision not to work for small studios anymore. Like in, in a lot of ways, it was kind of all I knew. And, and, and I think had the Whitney job not come up, I would have just pursued another small studio job. But, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think that like, because of this like scale of the small studio, it, it is a hustle. And, and, um, and I think that like, I was reaching a point in my life where, I wanted better work-life balance um, and I wanted to, yeah, I, I, I was getting a little bit burnt out um, by sort of like the constant go, go, go and working 12 hours <laughs> like a day, you know, like kind of rhythm of the, stu of the smaller studio. Um, so I was actually, um, after I left MTWTF, I was just freelancing for a little bit and then the Whitney job came up and I, I actually was hesitant at first because, you know, I think like when you, when your experience lies mostly with small studios, like sometimes, um, the idea of working in-house can seem like, oh, can seem a little bit like less exciting. Like, um, you know, I, I think I was worried that. Uh, that maybe that maybe I would get bored really easily or that we would just be stuck doing the same thing over and over again, you know, just like putting a logo on stuff and that, you know, that like creatively I wouldn't really be able to grow. But when the Whitney job came up, um, I think it was a combination of the graphic identity that Jet Set had designed. Like it's really, you know, it's designed by designers. And so really with the kind of like, yeah, it has many rules, but like the, I think like their goal is to ultimately give the designers who work with the system a sense of authorship and a sense of, you know, agency. Like, and, and I really, I, I do think that it achieves that. And, um, and then the other part of, other motivation for, applying to the Whitney job was the new building. Like, uh, you know, working in small studios, I'm used to being in one room with like six people and no one's talking to each other, you know, like that, that's like, that's been my experience. And so like, yeah, just very plainly, I just wanted to work. I had never worked in like a brand new Balti Ford museum before. And um, yeah, it just seemed, it seemed like a very exciting time to be part of the team and to also kind of help realize um, the identity in physical space. Awesome, thank you so much. No problem. I'm gonna take my AirPods out because I think they're dying, but um, so hang on one sec. Um, if, if you click on the menu by the um, mute button, you can change your um, microphone and um, speaker settings. I think we can hear you now. Ah, good. <laughs> um, I'll ask you a question. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, what was, uh, what would be a piece of advice that you wish that you had gotten when you were first, uh, mm. heading into design? Yeah. Mm, I guess like one piece of advice would be to work in a lot of different places. You know, like, I think like I, my experience obviously had just been small studios and now the Whitney. But I, I, you know, I think there are many other kind of environments where design can 
you know, play a role and like, or, you know, for instance, like agencies or, you know, or even like, like smaller kind of smaller operations or, um, or like more tech oriented startups or something like that. I think that um, for people who are just starting out, it's, you kind of, you gain valuable information by kind of putting yourself into different environments. And, you know, even if you don't like what you do, or even if you don't like, end up liking the, the kind of place where you work, I think that that's still information that you can use. Like, then, you know, oh, I'm never going to work here again, <laughs> or like work at this type of job. I think, you know, it's when you're just starting out, it's a lot about um, self-discovery. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions from the, the group? Um, I have a question. Um, and I'm not sure you if you mentioned this, but like how many people, how many of these graphic designers in Whitney? Because um, I think, because then I imagine the smaller studio and the Whitney because um, I kind of like, Smaller studios make you corporate like collaborate with other designers because they're smaller than Whitney. But you mentioned that like um, Whitney is more um, actively work together, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, so the in house team is actually like around. It's usually it's usually um, Hillary Greenbaum, the design director, and then she usually has a team of about like four to six. So it is a pretty small team too. Um, I think like the, the, the difference, maybe uh, this was also part of somebody else's question earlier, um, but the difference I would say between, you know, the small studio dynamic and the, and the way the graphic design department at the Whitney runs is that um, uh, you do have a lot more ownership over projects like basically there's like a system that comes in where people at the museum, um, uh, you know, put in a job request for a project and then Hillary reviews it and she assigns it to a designer. And so from that point on, you know, um, the, that designer is responsible for, you know, emailing the stakeholder and for, for every aspect of the project from start to like production. So I think in that sense, like it does operate, you're, you're almost operating like your own studio, but with like the support of, you know, the other designers around and obviously, um, you know, also the support of the design director and stuff, should anything, should you need to kind of like consult or navigate anything about the project. Um, so I think that like, it may not be collaborative. I mean, for larger projects, we have worked together, for instance, special exhibitions like the biennial or, you know, large shows. Um, in 2018, we had a big Andy Warhol show. Um, so, you know, in those instances, the, the team does come together and everybody does work on the same thing, which is sketching a sub identity. Um, so, uh, I think those moments are nice because you it's like it's in, informal but like it's an opportunity where everybody is working on the same thing um but other than that like i i don't think it is not collaborative in the same way as a small studio but in a lot of ways i think that um in a small studio a lot of the times you don't get the um you don't get the big picture especially if you're a more junior designer like you're given like a task, but maybe you don't go to the meetings, you know, so you don't know what people are saying. And so I think that that is definitely a big difference. And, and that's what I find to be so rewarding. And, um, and, and now in retrospect, when I think about it, that was one of the things that like, I wish was different when I worked in a smaller studio, which is that like, a lot of the times you put in a lot of work, but you're not um, you're not always like the point person and so you don't maybe you don't feel like you have as much authorship so you're you're just kind of you know doing your own like kind of like very concentrated thing but have no sense of like what the larger conversation is thank you you're welcome
Anyone else? <laughs> I guess not. Um, well, uh, Virginia, thank you. Um, it was really nice to see you. Um, and um, it was really nice to hear you talk through um, all of your work, both work that I've seen before and work that I have. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that was, that was really fun. Um, uh, for the members of our audience, um, I wanted to remind you that um, tomorrow morning we have uh, Hisentio and um, Susie Chan presenting and then uh, Thursday at noon, uh, Pablo Medina is presenting. Um, and you can find all the links for those on our social media. Um, but Virginia, thank you thank so much. You guys. Thanks for bearing with me <laughs> through all the signage stuff. I know this yeah. is like a lot of like process stuff that you don't usually talk about, but I thought maybe this would be interesting to people who are just starting out. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Isaac. <laughs> Bye.